Good evening, everyone. My name is Winoka Yepa. I am Dene, originally from Chibok, New Mexico, and I am the Senior Museum Education Manager at the IAIA Museum of Contemporary Native Arts. I would like to welcome all of you to our virtual artist talk with Luzine Hill. Luzine Hill is an enrolled member of the Eastern Band Cherokee. Um, she is living and working in Atlanta, Georgia. However, she is currently here in New Mexico. Um, Hill is a multimedia artist best known for socially engaged conceptual installations, which incorporates performance and action. Her work reflects interdisciplinary scholarship in visual art, women's studies, and Native American culture, um, topics that are integral to her background and personal journey. Through work informed by pre-contact culture of the Americas, Hill advocates for indigenous sovereignty, linguistic, cultural, and personal sovereignty. So I will pass it along to Lizine to introduce herself in her own words and to share her story with us. Hi, Winoka. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this residency. Um, I uh, am from Atlanta, uh, Eastern Band Cherokee, and my family lineage is through my grandmother, Lizine Sequoia Hill um, and the Bird Clan. I grew up in Atlanta and spent most of my life there. Um, I began making art around 1996. And in 1997, I um, exhibited for the first time at Indian Market, uh, which was <laughs> pretty amazing that I uh, managed to get accepted into that. Um, in 2006, I moved to North Carolina um, to immerse more in Cherokee culture and spend more time on my art. And um, my, both my grandparents uh, were sent to the Carlisle Indian boarding school and did not speak the language when they came back. Uh, they did not teach their children nor me the language. Um, and when I was in North Carolina, I had the great opportunity to work with a language revitalization program, uh, creating il uh, instruction books um, and illustrating them, uh, which gave me an opportunity to work with native speakers. And that enhanced my interest in pre-contact indigenous culture. Uh, it reinforced my belief that that uncorrupted culture uh, is what we need to um, find and preserve. So my natural inclination to uh, be interested in uh, pre-contact culture and uh, beautiful sculpture also got me interested in the language and the structure of the language and what that reflected in terms of cultural worldview, which was so different from European worldview. Uh, so that led me to, uh, that's in, influenced all of my work, um, that background and um, the quest for um, uncorrupted culture. So do you want to start the slides? Sure. Let me just bring it up here. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, today I'll be talking about three installations that use material volume as an artistic device. I take a number, um, a statistic, and represent that number with material volume to emphasize that number. Next slide. Great nations write their autobiographies in three manuscripts, the book of their deeds, the book of their words, and the book of their art. Not one of these books can be understood unless we read the two others, but of the three, the only trustworthy one is the last. Um, that's a quote from John Ruskin that I came across many years before I even started making art, but it resonated with me. And I think that for Native American art, um, 
it's especially important because um, so much of our history is uh, oral tradition and images. Next. In addition to um, material volume representing uh, numbers in a, what I hope is a dramatic way, um, conceptual installations tend to be about thinking and the idea, um, a lot of research, which I love, but it's creating that idea and working out that the idea uh, isn't making work. Uh, creating large volume of things um, in these installations gets me into the making process. And it becomes um, a very meditative, but it's also that studio kind of art zone that is, uh, is so productive for an artist. It, it's very uh, nurturing and it fills you up uh, being in the studio and doing something with your hands and being physical, I think. Next. I'm going to show work from The Body and Blood, Retracing the Trace, and Innate, uh, all of which deal with the subject of violence against women. This is a close-up of 24,480 dried rose petals in the installation, The Body and Blood. Next. In this work, Retracing the Trace, I was covered with 3,780 knotted cords to create a body imprint on the floor. Next. This is a close-up of 6,956 goddess silhouettes uh, cut out of silk taffeta that had been dyed with cochineal. The Body and Blood. This is a close-up of my grandmother's honeysuckle basket, which served as a receptacle uh, in this installation as I poured uh, the dried rose petals into it. This work was based on the number, statistics in 2009, of reported sexual assaults in the United States in one day, uh, which at that time was reported to be 720. However, um, only 16% of sexual assaults are ever reported. And so that's only a small portion of the actual violence. This work uh, was up um, for 34 days. So I multiplied 34 uh, by 720 and came up with the number 24,480. Next. This is the, a view of uh, the installation near the end of the exhibit with most of the petals uh, pouring onto the floor. There was a sound component also to this work. Um, every two minutes, which is what 720 per day uh, is, um, Sanctus bells rang softly in the gallery. This was the first installation that I made about violence to, against women. And it was difficult for me personally, um, as I'm a survivor of um, a violent sexual assault. A friend of mine, um, my best friend, uh, was talking to me about uh, what I was going to do for this uh, 
installation, and I had been invited to make work um, for uh, a human rights conference. She told me about uh, an amazing play called Ruined, um, about atrocities that were going on in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, so I got to see that play uh, and was astounded at the impact that art could have um, about topics like this and um, how, how strong a voice they gave. Um, I wasn't sure that I wanted to do this myself, um, but I started researching, uh, looking at statistics, and I, I was appalled at just those numbers. And these were only broad statistics about assault in the U.S. over the general population. Um, and as I researched, I discovered the uh, statistics about Native American women um, who were sexually assaulted. And what I could find uh, implied even more appalling numbers. So I thought that I didn't have any choice but to, to do this work. Um, it was hard and um, I was reinforced though over that month that it was up by comments in the gallery book and at the reception, people coming up and talking to me um, because I was bringing this topic out of the shadows and provoking a dialogue about um, a subject that isn't talked about. And that silence is um, deadly to changing the statistics and making things better. Uh, so I, I thought, well, I will continue to try to do this work on this topic. And um, a couple of years later, I completed um, my next installation called Retracing the Trace. Here, I decided to focus on what is estimated to be the unreported assault, taking that 720 to represent 16%. I extrapolated out that number um, to come to uh, 3,780. So, that's 3,780 assaults that aren't reported every day in the U.S. in one 24-hour period. Next slide. I was covered first with the cords, and then I got up and left um, a body imprint which is here. Each of these chords is a specific number between zero and 3,780 that I nodded and then dyed and stained um, over several months. Um, I researched um, the Inca Kipu and made these chords according to the basic, very basic principles of, of numbering um, that didn't get into the actual storytelling or um, writing that the kipu uh, also does. Um, but it was important that to me, as I was making these, um, in addition to just putting out that volume, that, that number, that big number, and um, emphasizing that, um, that each of the chords has, looks different. If you, if you look at them individually, 
they they are different. The knots are in different places, the kind of knots. And so these cords that represented unreported assaults represented women who did not report. In this work, they are being counted and they are being counted as individuals and each of them is an individual, uh, not just a number. Next. And here you can see a little bit more about how the cords look when they're uh, separated out. Um, when I began moving the cords from the floor to the walls to create a continuous line around the gallery, I also was vanquishing that image of violence that was on the floor. And part of this, um, because this was so much um, about my own experience, um, the Body and Blood was, was looking at this uh, issue in uh, a personally detached way. Um, but when I, I began making uh, Retracing the Trace, I um, was influenced by Anna Mendieta's work um, of uh, the silhouettes that she did, uh, which were making body prints uh, on the ground and flowers um, in the snow. Um, so I, I was deeply touched by the things that she did, and I felt as though her using her body as part of the work, as uh, an instrument of, of making the work, somehow really spoke very personally to me. And that's why I decided that this particular installation, Retracing the Trace, made the gallery a metaphor for my own body. Um, there's, there are three elements to this work. There's the, the body print that was on the floor at the beginning. Uh, there's the ritual of moving the cords um, to the um, walls. And there's the numbers uh, that are emphasized for a 24-hour period. Um, when I started this, uh, I stenciled uh, zero through 2400 around the gallery walls um, in intervals. Um, and then I started putting the cords up between 7 a.m. and 8 a.m. Uh, which is the time when I was attacked uh, as I was running, uh, jogging in a park in Atlanta in 1994. And now the next slide is a video. Uh, that's a close, yeah, a video of the... Um, process of my making uh, the body print, moving the cords to the wall, and completing this work, which was done uh, by the Idle Joy Museum. And um, I think it's a good illustration, and it shows the process of, of this kind of work. The goal is for it to be loose and just happened. When I lie down, Jennifer, I'm thinking I should, I should, the body should be a little bit more to the center, but not, but further back or. Uh -huh. you know, I, when I was thinking about it, I thought, I thought of it actually as angled that way, but a little further back. Okay, back and over that way. No, I think. I don't think angled that way, but a little further back. Okay, yeah. good. Okay, totally. yeah, good. That was originally how I had done it, and the square, the more square. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna lie down, so you direct me if you think I need to go. 
Okay. Do you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. The the idea is to have it look like a spill of um, blood, um, mud and blood. Getting the imprint is important, but also you start off light, right. and then you, toward the body, you get it a little bit heavier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then a little bit heavier around the body, close to the body, so that there can be something of a buildup.
Okay. Um, innate uh, is the third installation that I made about violence against women, specifically sexual assaults against Native American women. This is a still from uh, an action I did in the gallery uh, when the work was installed at the Portland Art Museum. This is the outer cape, uh, which is made of 6,956 goddess silhouettes I cut from uh, cochineal dyed silk taffeta. Uh, I began looking for the earliest images of uh, females in the Americas and uh, found some uh, Valdivia goddesses and I used those to, uh, to cut the silhouettes. This is also um, a still from the action. This is the inner cape um, of cochineal dyed silk organza. And um, here is a video uh, interview at the Portland Art Museum that explains this work and the action. My name is Luzine Hill. I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I'm Eastern Band Cherokee. My name in Cherokee is Rishini Otanoe. Innate is the title of my work um, and it deals with the issue of violence against women, and especially violence against Native women. And since 2009, I've been dealing with the device of material volume, which I use to present visual material numbers uh, because I feel that it has a, a larger impact. And using that to present the numbers and stats about Native women. The outer cape in this exhibition is made up of 6,956 cut silk figures. Uh, 6,956 is the average number uh, of Native American women who are sexually assaulted each year. And only 16% of assaults are ever reported. So it's just a tiny portion and we don't have a way of knowing what the real number is. This cape is made of those figures that are based on a goddess figure. That's one of the earliest images of women. Uh, from the coastal area of Ecuador, and it has been dyed with cochineal. Over the past few years, I have been researching early indigenous culture. Uh, I worked with a quipu uh, quite a bit for a couple of years, the Inca quipu knotted accounting system as a device. And while I was continuing my research last summer, with the quipu, I came across the mention of cochineal, uh, and I only knew that it was a color and maybe a dye. I didn't know anything about it. And when I started looking at it, I, I learned so much uh, about how significant it was to the history of Native people because it was used for millennium uh, for painting and for dyeing textiles uh, that were for sacred ceremonies generally. When the Spanish uh, came into the Americas, the cochineal was so much more intense, the color, than anything that was able, they had in Europe that was from plant-based colors, that it was hoarded and exported to Spain. The, the cochineal color comes from tiny bugs, insects, that, and the color is in the female bug. It's carminic acid that um, is a deterrent against predators. So when I learned about the impact of Spanish uh, colonialism, which expands to almost everything in the Americas, to the people, to the land, to the plants, and then the fact that the bugs were, were it was protection for females, I felt as though that had to be what I used. And um, that's why 
it's giving protection and it's giving strength to my bark and to the women that are represented here. The 6,956 individual goddess figures I grouped together in uh, clusters of three because Native women are three times more likely to be assaulted than other women in the United States and 90% of the assaults are by non-Native men. Um, and that's uh, an anomaly in terms of uh, ethnic uh, interaction, uh, and it's unique. The inner cape is also dyed with cochineal. Uh, it's made of silk organza. And the outer cape presents the numbers um, to draw attention and provoke dialogue and to inform. Um, it also serves as um, a metaphor for Native women having power and having protection. The inner cape is the remaining protection that is here in the gallery and it is metaphorically for everyone to absorb. Uh, and then the third component is uh, are the cochineal, which I use, the bugs that I use to dye the, the silk. The action uh, is something new for me uh, as an artist. Um, I've done a little bit, but it was more ritual in a, a previous work. All of the work draws on very early indigenous culture in the Americas and uh, the early female images, the cochineal, and um, common in Native uh, mythology are shapeshifters. And so my action is shapeshifting an amorphous uh, mass of material, which the cape, the outer cape is, it covers me, and it's not moving, and then I animate it from within. Um, I bring it to life, uh, I'm not disclosing that I'm under it, and then it gradually rises up and moves, uh, and I'm speaking of it as its own separate thing, uh, which it has become for me. Um, and then I become not that mass and not amorphous, but I become representative of a woman covered with the cape and covered with the protection and being empowered by the collection of women, each of whom is a survivor and she is now imbued with cochineal protection and she is now a goddess image and she is powerful. The outer cape lifts off me and then I emerge from the outer cape with a feeling of strength and empowerment. I move and I discover what that feels like and gain strength as I'm moving across the gallery, headed back somewhat toward where the cape had come from, but then I see this area that is just white infinity for me and know that that's where I want to go because I know I can do it and I can just move into it. And I do that and then I disappear, but the cape and the power and the protection stays here. Sexual assault is shrouded in silence by society and by survivors because it's a very personal violation. And I want to provoke dialogue and conversation because until that happens, then it's not going to decrease. Um, it, silence of society about that issue gives consent to continue. And that's, that's why I do the work. It was important for uh, Brenda and I to have 
the titles of our work translated uh, into the Cherokee syllabary. Uh, Cherokee language is an endangered language. And um, just visually having it up is just having it out there, you know, just having it in the universe and having people look at it and maybe question what it is, maybe find out more about it. And um, it's, it's amazing. It's very interesting. I wish that I spoke it other than my name. Thank you. Um, I want to add that um, Innate was part of a two-person show at Portland Art Museum. Um, and Brenda Mallory, who is a Portland-based artist and a dear friend, um, shared that space with me. Uh, Brenda is Cherokee Nation and originally from Oklahoma. The cape from Innate uh, is currently on display, the Outer Cape, uh, in Santa Fe, uh, in the Indigenous Futurism Show at the Museum of Native Arts and Contemporary Native Arts. <laughs> Keeping it all straight here. Um, the Retracing the Trace installation is also up right now. Um, at the Idle Joy Museum in uh, a six person show uh, entitled Powerful Women. And I have um, new work uh, at 516 Arts in Albuquerque, uh, part of the feminism show. Uh, that work is called Retribute. Uh, you can see it uh, on the 516 website and also they are open uh, with COVID protocols right now. Um, that work doesn't use material volume and numbers, uh, but it does continue uh, the motif of um, early female images and the goddesses. And all of my work uh, co coming forward um, you know, ref continues that quest for early culture uh, and matrilineal societies, which uh, I'm doing a lot of research on now. Um, and I want to keep working on that um, because I feel that it's a way of pushing back uh, against patriarchal colonialism and um, advocating for female agency and power. That's it. Well, thank you so much, Luzine. That was very powerful. Um, thank you. When I was, yeah, when I was listening to your presentation, it was, you know, there was so much, you know, to be said, and I really agree with you about continuing the dialogue when it comes to violence against Native women, for sure. Um, one thing that I was wondering about, um, as a museum educator, um, and giving tours, and, you know, and teaching a lot of docents and gallery guides, you know, how to talk about this work and how to say it within, you know, a positive way that offers more dialogue on, you know, the social and political crises that, you know, we are currently facing. And I was just wondering of like, what sort of responses have you received in relation to, to innate or in relation to any of your other work that you have been, that you have been doing or have done? Um, interesting uh, about your mention of docents because um, every time I do these installations, then I will speak with them when I'm in the, the museum. And um, often there is that hesitancy. Well, how do I talk to people about this? And, you know, because there is that huge sort of silence enveloping this. Um, 
invariably um, the work elicits personal responses with me and the docents by people about their personal experience or their feelings. Um, and it, it always, always um, brings people to me saying thank you. And I'm not doing it for people to say thank you to me. But it's that finally, I think they're feeling finally that, you know, if I'm not ready to talk about it myself and about my experience, someone is, is talking. And so I feel as though I'm giving a voice uh, because I never intended to talk about this experience, my own experience. Um, and for probably 15 years, um, only about five or six people uh, knew what had happened to me. Uh, and that includes family <laughs> and friends. Uh, this was, I was determined to um, process it and be a survivor and not a victim. Um, and so um, when I realized what I felt I had to do with the art, then that has sort of driven me. Um, and it continues to. Every single time this work is up, um, I get more reinforcement to know you have to keep talking about it and you have to keep provoking the dialogue. No, I mean, that's definitely true. And um, I was curious um, as to innate, particularly because every day there are you know, more cases, there are more women, you know, that experience violence and not always, the, the statistics are not always updated, uh, um, you know, and sometimes it does take a, a long time to update those. Um, but I always wondered if there, um, if you were ever going to add to innate to reflect those new cases or reflect those, you know, statistics. I don't know. I've thought about it. Um, when I have found a number, uh, like 6,000, seven, almost 7,000, that number um, was actually uh, presumably an average over 12 years. Mm -hmm. um, and probably it was maybe 10 years ago. Um, and so the, the numbers are not, they're not known. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, not that um, accurate because authorities are not uh, scrupulous about uh, collecting that data. Um, but when I can get a number that, that feels okay, that's kind of a number that I can work with, then the precise number isn't that important as just here's a really big number and here's what it looks like. Uh, and that's kind of what I do with the material volume is, hey, look at this. This is a lot. And you can say, you know, 3,780 and people don't really think about how many chords that is or how it goes around a gallery wall. Um, and so I, you know, I, I use the numbers and some of them are, I note in my, in my um, talks and in my statement, but they are, you know, an approximate thing. And that's the tragedy is that we don't know. Uh, we don't even know the ones that are reported because I don't think that that data is accurate at all. So. No, definitely. And um, the other, the other thing I was thinking about was um, in your other piece of work, um, retracing the trace. Um, I always see, I always see art as the process being more important than the actual piece because the process can tell a lot, you know, um, because there's always a story behind it and. Storytelling, storytelling to me is very important and it's very much embedded 
in our indigenous cultures. And so, and for me as a, I'm a photographer. And so that's my, you know, artistic relief, I guess. And I always find it very meditative. And I always, you know, would like, always like to ask others, you know, what does the process feel for you? And what does it mean to you? You know, is it meditative is a way of, you know, solidifying something or release of some sort, you know, I was just curious. It is. And I, when I get to that stage of, of the work, uh, after I get the concept determined, um, then the, the drying 24,480 rose petals and counting them several times, um, was extremely meditative. And then I began to look at each petal mm -hmm. as a person. You know, I'm, I, that's what I'm going through. And the same thing happened when I was nodding those chords. Um, uh, because I was doing those numbers and it took, it took a while to do each chord, uh, I would write down the number, you know, beginning one, you know, one and then two. Um, on, and it, I have... Um, that notebook that I wrote on, because this went over maybe like three months of, of nodding. And so it was a spiral notebook and I, you know, each number. And then I would, you know, I would get a total at the, after, you know, five or six lines. And um, sometimes in the margin, I would write, um, you know, 150 done in this many hours. Uh, you know, to give me a sense of how much more I had to do and how long it was going to take me. Um, also in the margins of that notebook, um, I've got uh, yogurt, lettuce. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, while I'm sitting there nodding these things, I'm thinking, oh, I need these things from the store. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think that notebook is, is, a very personal reflection of the process. Uh, and it is, you're, you're totally right. Uh, art is the process uh, and it's a gift to be an artist and be able to uh, engage in that process. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. No, I totally agree. And um, I like that you said, you know, that you journal throughout your entire process. Cause that's such, that's so very important. Journaling is something that I, that I do quite often. Yeah. And so um, another thing that I was interested in is when you um, talked about um, your, you know, your experience with um, language and boarding school and the reflection of that. And, you know, um, I was looking through your website and you actually did a project on language revitalization um, in relation to the Cherokee syllabary. And I just wanted to kind of you know, learn more about that. Um, I um, got the opportunity when I was in North Carolina um, and I was, uh, I went back to graduate school when I was up there um, and was looking for something to do part-time, uh, you know, part-time work study or something. And um, I went to the Cherokee Studies Department and said, you know, can I come in and, you know, do some typing or whatever. And they said, well, we need illustrations for our, instruct our language instruction books. And I said, at this point, I had been doing abstract expressive drawings and paintings and beginning to do sculpture. And I said, I don't do illustrations. You know, it was sort of like, I don't do anything that precise. The things I do are kind of ambiguous. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, we need illustrations, Lucine. <laughs> and so I said, oh, I don't really do illustrations. Uh, but then I thought, well, I'm going to figure out how to do this. And it ended up that um, I found that I could do kind of rendering images that were precise illustrative kind of things if I cut them out mm -hmm. and did cutouts um, and I think that comes from 
loving to play with paper dolls when I was a little girl. Um, but that worked out for me to do it that way. And um, it also, uh, they were collage. And collage is something that I really uh, value and enjoy. And I use in my, in my abstract drawings too. But um, it, that was the only way I couldn't have done really precise renderings and illustrations. I, you know, that just isn't the kind of work that I do. But um, mm -hmm. I thought it was important. And then I thought, okay, I'll try this. And I did. And then um, I did actually four uh, books that were missed um, over several years uh, with the revitalization project. And uh, then a couple of years later, I had the opportunity to uh, do a letterpress book, um, which is on my website, uh, on Spearfinger, which was one of the original books that I had done in the cut, cut paper illustrations. Um, and that book is in syllabary only. Uh, I had originally thought that I would do it a bilingual book, but as I worked on that, it became really, really important that um, I not put the Cherokee syllabary in something that was slightly remotely secondary, having English there too. Um, so uh, that was kind of a, a, a way of uh, expressing cultural sovereignty and language sovereignty. Uh, and um, so it, it stands alone it stands by itself so were you, um, were you able to learn some of your language while going through that process or? I learned a few words here and there and I had when I moved to North Carolina um, I had that ambition to mm -hmm. to not expect to be fluent but um, to you know to learn enough um, and I then I discovered it was it was really hard uh, because it's completely so different and there are no cognizance, uh, you know, learning a romance language. Mm -hmm. We've got all those cognizance that we can, you know, that pull from. You already know, you know, a lot of the language or can figure it out. Um, but the important part of working on that project to me uh, was the fact that I did work uh, and talk with native speakers because I was needing to get a really good illustration of what those particular words on the page were saying. And that gave me uh, a, a wonderful view of um, indigenous culture and how different it is, how misunderstood it has been, how diminished it has been. And that's just, um, push me forward to keep, you know, digging, 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 and, and putting that out. Uh, and, you know, look at this. Mm -hmm. You may not understand it, but try, you know, look into it. Try to look at this viewpoint, this worldview, as not interpreted by Western thought. Mm -hmm. And that's hard. Uh, but that was, that was enormously important going forward uh, in all of my work. Mm -hmm. That's always there, you know, that, hmm, this is expressing something really different. And it's like the quipu uh, was so diminished and destroyed, Aztec codices were destroyed. Um, so um, some of you um, may know or not know, um, Luzine Hill is um, one of our social engagement art residents for this month. and. Um, our residency is virtual this time, and so um, she's actually sharing a lot of her work through a virtual studio that we have on a website that we developed for the, for the residents. Um, it's mokinaresidency.squarespace.com. Um, so she'll be sharing um, some of her work that she's doing and also some of the work that um, she wanted to engage in if the residency was in person. So um, we'll see some of that. But one final question I have for you. Luzine is, um, as a social engagement artist and 
Um, I just wanted to know, how do you see art as a method for addressing the social and political crises that is inherent here in the United, here in the U.S.? You know, um, what do you see art doing, you know, to address that and elicit dialogue and conversation? I um, feel very strongly about the concept of silence, being silenced, having a voice, and the idea that silence gives consent. So with my work, my goal is to not be silent. Uh, and to express uh, objection, uh, express a viewpoint uh, that uh, is not giving consent to what feels like is rolling over us uh, with so much power. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, and that can be done, you know, with with all art forms, and it can be done by voting mm -hmm. so yeah i think all of it is you know feeling like you have a voice mm -hmm. uh, for whatever you feel strongly about uh just you know use that voice mm -hmm. no i definitely agree and yes thank you for that little plug-in about voting voting is important <laughs> for sure you know it's a way of amplifying voices especially the voices of you know, a lot of marginalized communities for sure. Yes. yes. So definitely thank you for that. And um, thank you so much, you know, Luzine, for, you know, being a part of our residency, for taking time to share your story and your journey. I truly appreciate it. Um, and thank you all for taking part in our public programming. Um, have a good evening. <laughs>